reading this morning is taken from the book of Joshua, chapter 9. Now, when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, the kings in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea, as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and mouldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, we've come from a distant country, make a treaty with us. The Israelites said to the Hivites, but perhaps you live near us, so how can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, Who are you, and where do you come from? They answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon, king of Eshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, Take provisions for your journey, go and meet them and say to them, We are your servants, make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and mouldy it is. And these wineskins that were filled were new, but see how cracked they are and our clothes and sandals are worn out by a very long journey. The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. They made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbours living near them. So the Israelites set out and on the third day came to their cities. Gibeon, Kephira, Beeroth, and Kiriath Jearim. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders, but all the leaders answered, We've given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we'll do to them. We will let them live so that God's wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the whole assembly. So the leader's promise to them was kept. Then Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said, why did you deceive us by saying, we live a long way away from you? when actually you live near us. You are now under a curse. You will never be released from service as woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all of its inhabitants from before you. So we fear for our lives because of you. And that is why we did this. We are now in your hands. Do to us whatever seems good and right to you. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites and they did not kill them. But that day he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the Lord, the altar of the Lord, at the place the Lord would choose. And that is what they are to this day. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think God's through the word of God, right?
and just come under the power because God says that he honours his word above his name. It's interesting, you know, while we was just worshipping the Lord, you know, God just uh, gave me the word for a fellowship in the pregnancy. And I was thinking to myself, is he speaking about individuals being pregnant, etc.? But you know, then God spoke to me and said that when a lady was pregnant, you would say to her, are you expecting? And he spoke to me clearly and said, that which you're expecting, you will give birth to. Amen. If you're expecting nothing, you will give birth to nothing. But if you're expecting a lot, you will give birth to a lot. And then June shared with me really about just seeing uh, almost like someone trapped in an egg. Well, God wants to break those confinements around your life. Maybe just God wants to birth something in you that would come forth. So you believe the word of God and just stand on the promises of God and God will bring into your life that which you are expecting. You know, when we looked at the word of God, we can clearly see that the nation of Israel really is a pathetic type of the church today. In other words, there are parallels that can be drawn. So when we look at certain incidents in the life of the nation of Israel, we can see the same type of events or the same types of happening coming into the church today or against the church today. So when Israel was actually entering into the promised land of God, and that really speaks of a new beginnings, a new life that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. When this nation was coming in to that promise of God, the Bible tells us that nations around them who had heard of the great things that God had done for the people of God came to war against Israel. So there was a coming together, a unity of wickedness, a solidarity of sin, if you like, that came with one purpose, one accord, to destroy that which the Lord was establishing. You see, whenever we are entering in to the great works of God, whenever we want a deeper relationship with the living God, a closer walk with Him, intimacy with Him, that place will always be contending. Whenever you want to move in the blessings of God, it will be contending in your life because the enemy doesn't want you to achieve your God-given purpose but God is good and he will always supernaturally give you strategies not only to defeat the enemy and the enemy's purposes but to move into the promise that he has for you. And so in every situation it's important that we be people that inquire of the Lord. We're people that talk to the Lord, ask for his help, ask for his advice. You and I both know that the occasions that Israel suffered defeat they were times when Israel were either disobedient to the Lord or they failed to inquire of him, just like in the scripture that we've read this morning. So when the people of God failed to inquire of the Lord, they are really saying without words that I can deal with this situation myself. So they rely upon their own ability, their own understanding to achieve the purposes of God. And when this happens in your life, it's a recipe for disaster because God says in his word to trust in him with all your heart. Don't to lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, not some of your ways, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So God wants you in everything that you do, little things, great things, to inquire of him. Because when you inquire of the Lord, you're inviting him into that situation. But when you do things off your own steam, you are leaving him outside. You are shutting door, a door in his face and to that supernatural advice that he wants to bring. You see, the enemy knows that there is more than one way to shipwreck a ministry, to shipwreck a calling, to shipwreck a promise of God. He wants to destroy your destiny. So instead of just moving against you with a direct attack, which initially was the intentions of these people, the enemy will often move with a deception because he knows that you are aware. If the enemy comes and faces up to you, you are aware of that attack and you will directly go to the Lord. But if the enemy brings in a deception, you might not notice it. And so the enemy often brings in a deception. So Joshua 9 verse 3 to 4 says, When the people, the people of Gibeon, when those people heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. And a ruse is an action. It's an intention. 
It's to deceive or trick a person or a people. It's a scheme. And the Bible says we're not unaware of the enemy's schemes, his strategies that he uses against you. But in this case, the enemy brought that ruse. It was a lie that was brought to Joshua. And Joshua and the leaders of Israel, he questioned the men of Gibeon. They listened to the words that they said, and the evil sampled their provisions, meaning they weighed up the evidence they was bringing. So the words they said, the evidence they showed them, all spoke of their message to Joshua as being true. But yet it was a lie. He never inquired of the Lord. And we need to be people that actually inquire of the Lord. In other words, Joshua and the children of Israel at that time was not walking by faith, but by sight. They went off what their eyes saw. The bread's moldy, the shoes are worn out. What they're saying seems to, to line up. But they never inquired of the Lord. They left him out in that particular situation. And you know, you're gonna weigh this up. It's that God said to the children of Israel, when you went to the land of Canaan, you were to make no covenant with the people there. That was a command of God. And yet we see, because they're going outside, outside they thinking everything is okay. How many times have you, the people of God, been deceived? Because we hear stories that people bring us, we look at the evidence, we can even look at the people's lives and think, well, this person seems to be okay. But we never inquire of God, and so we enter into agreements that we should never enter into. That's exactly what was happening with Joshua. And yet he was a mighty man of God. He was the leader of that nation, the leader of the people of God. Moved in supernatural power. Spoke to the sun in the sky and he stood still. This was the power of this man. But yet the simple ruse of the enemy caused him to fail to ask the living God. When you inquire of God, you are asking him for supernatural information. Information that not would be forthcoming from a person. And there are many people you have met in your life that are not forthcoming with information, that leave little bits out conveniently to wheel you in. You need to be people that inquire of the Lord. So Joshua, at this moment in his life, was walking by sight and not by faith. And the people of God today enter into business deals, make agreements, we establish covenants with people, and you know, really, these are ungodly things simply because we look at that person's life. We have to be people that inquire of the Lord because God knows the heart of a person and he knows the intentions of that heart. I had a man who came to me and this man came to me and said, I'm, I'm looking to buy a motorbike. And he said, would you be the guarantor of this loan you've agreed to give me? And I said, no, I cannot be. A guarantee. Why not, your friend, etc., go to your church? I said, I cannot be a guarantor of that because the word of God tells me not to be a guarantor because if you default on that payment, even though you're promising me that you won't default, if you default, I am liable to pay for that motorbike. I am sorry, but you shouldn't be putting me in that position and asking me to do that because it's contrary to the word of God. That man left the church. What was he after? Me paying for his motorbike? <laughs> he left as fast as if it was homo. <laughs> you need to be people that stand upon the promises of God. Even if it hurts, we have to be people that obey. God knows the hearts of people. These massive deceptions that keep believers enter into them. They make covenants, they make agreements with other people that are supposed to be believers, but they don't really know that their lifestyles and the way they accomplish their works are not right before God. We need to be people who understand this. A man on the street can be covered with a blanket, and that blanket can be a blanket of deception, and he may ask you for money, and you give him money. What you don't know is under that blanket of deception, a nice clothes, top quality trainers. You don't know that he lives in a home, he has his meal provided for them, and he's not a person genuine in need. But your human compassion overrides godly wisdom 
and you were deceived into giving this man money. That's not being a good steward. That's not inquiring of the Lord. Is this man genuinely in need? If God says he's genuine in need, then you can give as God directs. But if he's not in genuine need, he's a scammer. And there are many today, there's many who sit outside Tesco's and sit outside out there. Some of them will tell you that they make 80 pound a day. So they're making more money than you do in a week. And if no taxes, although they don't get paid through the bank, they just get paid in change. But they're making 80 pound a day. And they're simply preying upon people's compassion, tugging at their heartstrings. But it's a deception, it's a lie. And we need to be people that see through that God is not pleased when his people do not inquire of him. In every area of your life, you need to inquire. So the enemy seeks to really rob you of having that information that God longs to bring into your life. Even when we're praying, folks, we need to be people that ask of the Lord because we can be deceived. A man could come out to the front of the church and say, can you pray for my hand? I've broken a couple of fingers, I've had an accident, it's bruised, etc. Would you pray for my hand? And you would think nothing of saying, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command the bones to heal, I command the swelling to go or the bruising to go down in the name of Jesus and lose your health. But you might, might not know that that man got absolutely angry with his wife that morning and smashed the wall with his fist. He's got an anger issue. That's the real problem. And that's what God wants to reveal to you so you can start to counsel him. That he can move in repentance from that anger and be set free. His hand is not the real issue. We need to be people that inquire of the Lord. And God said to me today, tell them to inquire of me. You, you're leaving him out on many decisions in your life. You're not inquiring of the Lord. What are you saying about this sickness that's affecting my life, Lord? What is the root cause of it? It is a lady who's pregnant. She wants to get pregnant and so has been kept from her. It might not just be a case of you praying for her. It may be a breaking of a curse that has been established in that life. Because God wants people to be fruitful. So you have to break that in order for the blessing of God to come in. So it's not to be taken in by just everything that people say, because on the surface, it looks good. Listen, folks, all that glitters isn't gold. That's right. So we need to be people that inquire of the Lord. I can't enforce that more to you. Ask the Lord. Don't sign agreements. Don't make pledges with people. Don't agree with other people. You don't know how they're working things out. If people are achieving even what they consider the works of God by a different means, then you need to inquire of the Lord and withdraw from that. Amen. Because God doesn't want you to have ungodly agreements. Joshua made a covenant with people who he was never supposed to make a covenant with. And because of covenant agreement, he was obliged to keep his word. Because God says, keep your word. You make a vow, keep your word. In fact, you shouldn't be making vows as a New Testament believer. Let your yes be yes and you no be no. But if you make a vow, you've got to keep it. You make that promise, you've got to keep it. And Joshua knew covenant agreement had to be uphold, even though it was founded upon lies. At that time, he didn't know. He made a covenant with liars. Who wants to make a covenant with a liar? He wants to make a covenant with a cheater. That's what's happening here. No inquiring of the Lord. And so there's always a consequence. So you have to withdraw from making covenant agreements with people whose lives that don't live right before him or people that try to achieve the works of God with ways that are contrary to the word of God. You've got to withdraw from that. How can you be in agreement? Because if you're in agreement with them, you're actually saying that I agree with what you were doing. We've got to move away. To me, any agreement or any alliance should never be entered into without inquiring of the Lord. And a man who came for some ministry, and he came to him and he said, my marriage, and he went through all his marriage being a sham. He said, I never should have married him in the first place. 
I said, did you inquire of the Lord? No. I said, well, what motivated you to marry her? And he admitted and he said to me, lust. I was just lusting after I just wanted her. I said, did she inquire of the Lord? He said, no, she never inquired as well. She just felt pressured and thought, oh, well, if he's asking, I'll give in to that. What a mess. I was supposed to sort that out. When they've never inquired of the Lord. You don't end, you don't enter into a marriage covenant without inquiring of the Lord. We need to be people that seek the Lord out for the man in our life, for the woman in our life. Isaac trusted his father's choice. Would you not trust your father's choice in these areas? I'm using this as an example because many people make agreements they should never make an agreement with people they should never make an agreement with. And there's always a consequence of what you're doing. You might think, well, it's not really affecting me, but let me just say it will catch you up. So when we read through the Word of God, God doesn't want us making agreements or alliances with people. An alliance is based on mutual benefit. It's a relationship based on mutual interest. Business companies make an alliance or an agreement where it's based on mutual interest. So you're part of that. And God sees you as part of that. If I, if I was asked to marry two to same-sex people, and I actually go through with that wedding, I'm agreeing with them. I'm agreeing with what they are standing for is right and true. And that is absolutely wrong where God is concerned. Even if these consequences are saying, no, I just don't do that. I'd sooner pay the consequences than offend my Lord. We need to be people that stand upon the promises of God. All the way through scripture, you will find people that made wrong agreements. What about King Jehoshaphat? It's okay for what you're talking about, Jehoshaphat, and saying how, oh, you know, he sent the praises first and how God gave him an amazing victory. You know, his weaknesses were making the wrong alliances. The Bible tells us that he made an alliance with Ahab through marriage. He himself didn't marry anyone from Ahab's family, but his son did. And he agreed to it. There is no record of him inquiring of the Lord. You know what happened to his son? His son followed the ways of the house of Ahab. Mm -hmm. So in other words, he adopted the, the, the belief systems, the lifestyle of his in-laws. And that was simply because Jehoshaphat, that man of God, never inquired of the Lord. The enemy skinned him. And what happened to his son? When his son became king, he killed all his brothers because he was not right before the Lord. And that's because of an ungodly agreement. Ungodly agreement can kill your brothers. We need to live right before the Lord. So this was an area where he failed. The Bible makes it clear his son married the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. A failure. You know a failure, you know what she did when she had the opportunity to seize the throne? She killed all in the royal household. You're part of that royal household today. And that basically means she killed her grandson. Her grandmother killed all her grandchildren, except one that got in the way. That all came because of one ungodly agreement. She was about to say, well, it's not affecting me. But it affected his children. It affected his grandchildren. It affected his, his, the destiny of that family line. We have to be people that make the right agreements before the law. Now you would think someone like Jehoshaphat would learn his lesson. But like many of us today, we never seem to learn lessons. And the Bible tells us that he made an ungodly agreement with an ungodly king of Israel. So the king of Judah made an agreement with the king of Israel. Isaiah, the Bible says. A-H-A-Z-A-I-H. -A -H. He made an agreement with that particular king. And it was a business adventure. And he was warned about it. And you know what the Lord had to do? Sink all his trading ships. In other words, he caused that business venture to crash. 
God, and he could have been praying all the time, Lord, would you cause my business to be successful? It's never going to work if it's based on ungodly agreement. Mm -hmm. So God caused his business venture to sin simply because he was displeased. But in the scripture that we've read this morning, we see that Joshua made an unauthorized agreement. God did not endorse it. He tells us the people of Israel endorsed it. They ratified it. They were in agreement with it. But God wasn't. I don't care if a whole congregation agree one thing and if God's saying another, I go with what God says. I've got a friend of mine, he's a Methodist minister. And in that particular uh, setup, they promoted same sex marriage. And if you don't agree with it, you can go for some counseling, re education. <laughs> They want to change you to make you think like them. And he's in that particular setup. And it's a difficult setup to be in when you've got to stand upon the promises of God and not just go along with what everything else, everyone else is doing. So if you go to the congregation and say, I'm against same sex marriage because it's against the, the contrary to the word of God, they could have you removed. So the congregation have a vote. Over the man of God. And the other man of God removed. How dangerous it is to just have the congregations ratifying things. And this is what you found in Israel. Joshua, you know, agreed with them and the people ratified it. They put their seal of approval upon that agreement, even though it was ungodly. But God had not put his seal of approval on it. And if God doesn't put his seal of approval on it, it's guaranteed for disaster. So whenever you miss out on asking God for supernatural information, supernatural advice, supernatural choices, there's a problem coming your way. And the enemy knows it. He may not be able to attack you up front, but he can deceive you and he can annihilate you, your household and generations to come. And that's exactly what happened in this particular situation. So Joshua made an unauthorized agreement with the Gideon people. He even found out that they deceived him, that they lied to him. But that agreement was binding. And because that agreement was binding, it now put Israel in a very difficult place. And sometimes your ungodly agreements will put you in a difficult place. But I praise God for his redemptive work, his power. Amen. Because I know this, before I became a believer, I probably made many ungodly agreements and many ungodly covenants with people. But once I made a covenant agreement with the living God, it cancelled those other covenants, those things that were stood against me, because I renounced them. I spoke them off. I renounced them, asked God for forgiveness, and it was broken in my life. There are many people today that are still living, believers today, under the consequences of ungodly covenants and agreements because they've never renounced. They've never spoke them off their lives. They've never cancelled those things that stand in against them by appropriating the finished work of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be people that appropriate what Jesus Christ has done for us. I praise God that this redemptive work, no matter what message we get in, that God can move in amazing power. And God gave Joshua a way out because they understood that these people had come to Joshua and they basically said, we are your servants. I don't know if you noticed when the reading was taking place, those Gibeonites said, we are your servants, and that's exactly what they became. He could not kill them because of covenant agreement, but he put them in servitude to the house of God forever. And I'm saying that when you enter into covenant agreement, you may think your hands are tied, but you can cause these things to serve the house of God forever. I know Christians who will apply for grants and they'll get the grant form and they'll fill in all the criteria the world wants you to hear. You support 
you know, diversity. Yes. And in ticking off things that are all contrary to the things of God. What's your opinion on homosexual? Do you support that? Yes. Mm. They're ticking off everything that's contrary to the word of God. And they do that to take money. So they can be given money. And you know what they say? We plunder in the world. No, they're not. When God told the children of Israel, go and ask the, the people of Egypt for wealth, gold, silver, items of clothing, cattle, whatever it was. Go and ask them for these things. He said, ask them, don't sign an agreement with them. He never told them to get out an agreement paper and to sign things up. He basically told them just to ask. Don't enter an agreement. Ask them and I'll make them favourable towards you and they will give to you. And that's exactly what they did. They didn't sign the things. Didn't move into agreement with them. If you give us this, we'll agree with your principles and your policies. How many believers do that today? They agree with the things of the world and they sign that agreement and they think they're being favoured and they think the word of God is going well. But it's unauthorised by heaven. It may be rubber stamped by your local authorities, but it's not authorised by the living God. Amen. You've got the agreements. Joshua was someone that made that ungodly agreement. Suddenly realised he'd been deceived. And I believe his heart was then open to the things of God. The great thing about Joshua was this. And what I'm saying was he heart open to the things of God. He knew that covenant just couldn't be broken. He knew it was in place. And so what he did, he never allowed one sin to lead to another sin by killing those people. That would have been adding insult to injury, one sin leading to another. Instead, he brought them into subjection or slavery exactly what they wanted so they would then serve the purposes of the house of God. And that's what the world should do. We need to be taking back things that the world has got. Mm -hmm. The world are only things. I looked at a local news yesterday and it was saying a seven million pound temple, a sin temple built in Oldham through donations of people. Wow. And the church are living in rented properties. We need to start to take things back. Amen. And take the real estate, the land that belongs to us, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't make wrong agreements, unholy covenants, rash vows and statements with people that they simply obey the word of God. The whole point of what I'm saying, as well as this, Israel was in a bad position because they never inquired of the Lord. The majority of the troubles you face are because you never inquired of the Lord. You do things yourself, you make your own decisions, and then when it goes pear shape, you blame God or you blame others. It's their fault, it's their fault, it's their, and you blame everyone else except yourself. Why didn't you inquire of the Lord? Israel was in that position. And Israel may have thought, well, really, this isn't going to affect us all. Absolutely. Any ungodly agreement. You know, these Gibeonites had that covenant agreement with Joshua, and that covenant agreement stood for generations, decade after decade. The Bible tells us years later, 2 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 1, it tells us that during the reign of King David, so this is after Joshua has gone on to glory. During the reign of King David, the Bible said there was a famine in the land for three successive years. The first time the famine hit the land, you probably just think it's a one-off, but then it happened the second year and the third year. So for three years, a famine had hit the land, so the economy of that particular nation had gone down. One of God's judgments, that, by the way, God doesn't just promise to send plagues, upon people that disobedience. He said, when I remove the rain. Well, the Bible tells us, if my people are called on my name, will humble themselves, pray, turn for their wicked ways, sit my face, then I'll learn from heaven. I'll answer those prayers, I'll heal your land. 
It's a judgment of God. Withholding rain is a judgment of God. The world wouldn't say that. You know what they say it was? Climate control, uh, climate change. It's easy to say it's climate change, the realism of the judgment of God on the nations. He's still a God to judge nations. <coughs> so we need to be aware that these things can be coming. We need to be living right with God and making our agreement with him and with him alone. So the Bible tells us that during the reign of King David, and King David had a heart after the Lord, during his reign, even though he was seeking God and restoring that nation, for three successive years, there was famine in the land. It was devastating the economy. And so David, what did he do? He inquired of the Lord. He says he sought the Lord. That means to inquire him. He brought that problem to the Lord so that God would give him insight so he would know the solution to it. So he inquired the Lord. Wouldn't it be amazing today if the heads of our state, the heads of our government would inquire of the Lord? He never inquire of the Lord. If they get any advice, it doesn't come from those that are born again of the Spirit of God. And if it did, many times they wouldn't ignore it. It needs to be a change of heart. But David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said to him, It's on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. And he said, Because he had put the Gibeonites to death. Well, didn't Joshua say to Israel, You spare their lives? Put them in servitude. And spare them. In fact, one of David's mighty men was a Gibeonite. So God promoted them up through the ranks. But Saul and his household, in other words, when it's saying his bloodstained house, it's saying not only did Saul agree to kill him, the Gibeonites, but members of his own family did as well. And this is why that when David went to the Gibeonites and said to them, you know, that we've done wrong, what can we do? And they said, we've got no right to ask for, for gold or silver or even to ask the death of, of all Saul's family. Well, just give us seven men from his family. Seven people from his family. Then we might think, well, that's just a random charge. Did they deserve it? They were in agreement with it. Absolutely agreement. And when they, lived, when they were executed, the Bible tells us the rain started to come. The lamb was healing. Our God is a God of amazing justice. And why I'm telling you this is because Joshua's covenant still had consequences for generations later. Amen. It came to pass in the times of David. Who knows what trouble your agreements today will cause your family tomorrow? You need to make sure you're living right before God and making God less agreements. One of the wisest things you could ever do is not only to ask Jesus Christ into your life, that's the wisest thing you could ever do, but it's to continue to speak to him and ask for his leading, his guidance, and inquire of him. One of the wisest kings in the Bible, and I'll read the story, it says this, so King Solomon ruled over Israel now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One of them said, my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house. I had had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There was no one in the house but the two of us. During the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while I, your servant, was still a slave. She put him to my breast and put, uh, put her son to her breast and put the dead son to my breast. The next morning I got up to nurse my son. He was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't my son that was born to me. The woman said, no, the living one is my son, the dead one is yours. But the first one insisted, no, the dead one is yours, the living one is mine. Can you imagine it? They argued before the king. Can you imagine that going on? And Solomon is there, and Solomon is waiting. And Solomon applied tremendous wisdom. The Bible says, the king said, this one says, my son is alive and your son is dead. Well, one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, Bring me a soul. Now what I'm saying to you today, there is no account in that scripture 
Oh, when Solomon said, I inquired of the Lord. When he inquired of the Lord, he said, bring me a sword. What is the sword of the Spirit? It's the Word of God. He was inquired, he was listening to it, he was open to what God was going to say to him. And he said, bring me a sword. Let's get the Word of God into the situation. And you may be put in impossible situations, you need to get the Word of God in. Jesus Christ was put in a similar situation about stoning a woman called an adulterer. And he says he bent down and he wrote upon the ground. And people debate and say, well, what was he writing? It's not important what he was writing. He was listening to his father. And he brought the wisdom, the advice that his father gave him. In other words, he was inquiring of the Lord. When was the last time? In the difficult situation, he inquired of the Lord. In impossible situation. No DNA test in those days. But the word of God, the word of God is a two-edged sword. It divides the bone, the marrow, the soul, the spirit. It exposes every part of your personality. It exposes lies. It exposes truth. So Solomon says, bring me a sword. Well, you can imagine it. And what happened? What happened? He said, cut the baby in two and give them half each. Well, well you know what happened then? The lady's baby it was says, no! Give the child to this one because she had compassion. Compassion for that child. The other woman was passionate, but she never had compassion. She said, let the child be cut in half. If I can't have him, you can't have him. How many are in the church like that today? If I can't have it, you're not having it. If I don't get blessed, you're not going to be blessed. If I can't be up front, I'm going to... I had a pastor who told me, that a person said to them recently, we're going to destroy the church. You know why? Simply because they're not having their way within the body of Christ. Not getting the platform. Not getting the recognition he wants. And he's saying, if I can't run it, no one's going to run it. And this is what happens within the body of Christ today. So Solomon saw the compassion of the true mother. He saw the passion, the fervent said, of that evil woman. But he never judged her. You know why he never judged her? Because forever she would be known as a liar. Forever. That's what people would remember her for. She was a liar, a deceiver, and she was prepared even to let a child die to save her own face. And the amazing thing is that the Bible tells us when all Israel heard his verdict the king had given they held the king in awe because they saw he had wisdom from God to administer justice. You need the wisdom of God to administer justice in every agreement you make. Amen. You ask the Lord, is it right? Well, I'm going to take the mortgage out of this company or that company, take them out with that. They might not all have godly principles within their life, but God endorses that and says, yes, you can have that. We need to be people that listen to the living God. Are you listening today? Are you open to his wisdom speaking into your life? Are you just somebody who thinks to yourself, well, I'll just do it my way? When you start to do it your way, you will suffer amazing consequences. This is why the word of God says, Paul says, in him I live and move and have my being. Everything has to come from him. Oh, it's so good. He's so good today. He loves you so much. The only agreement he wants you to have is with him. Amen. With him. And from that agreement with him, provisions of the Father's house will come to you. He's an amazing God. The wisdom of Jesus can flow into your life like never before. We need to be people that trust in the living God. And so the message today is to always inquire of the Lord. Why no? The wonderful counselor. People are going to counseling today. They got problems with the mind. They go to a psychiatrist. They've got problems with the body. They go to the doctors. Why not just go to the wonderful counselor? Why not inquire of the Lord? And he will show you the root cause of any issue you are facing so that his healing power can come. It's a beautiful work of God.
We're going to pray right now. You want to respond to the word of God. You need to respond to the word of God. If you may go in godly agreement, you need to seek the Lord out, the way out, out. Just like Joshua. Just like uh, the people of Israel did then. Yes, there was those that wanted to kill them, but Joshua preserved their life because of agreement. And we need to be people that know that because of our agreement with the Lord, we can preserve the lives of others. It can bring them into right relation. That's why I'll stand on the street. Because I know people need to hear the truth of God's word. And they're not going to be safe unless someone speaks to them. Let's be people that inquire the Lord to do exactly what he says in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask for forgiveness and we renounce every agreement that we have made or been made on our behalf. And we've entered into agreements where we've not really known the details. We've not inquired of you. Lord, we ask for forgiveness when we've not inquired of you and we've put ourselves into a difficult place. Father, I pray because of the redemptive power of Jesus, because of the blood, that Lord God, you would start to get us out of places and agreements that we should never be in, in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And today, we simply want, Father God, to reinforce our agreement with you that we've bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. We are not our own. We'd be more than a price, and we belong to you. We trust in you, and you alone, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.